Hi, I'm Ryan Nemeth. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Please subscribe to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Because if you don't, I'm just going to be so sad. Is that okay? It's not okay that you're sad. Please subscribe to the Sarah O'Connell Show. And if you don't, I'm going to come find you and uh, shove you around. That's going to look so good with 3D glasses on. <laughs> People are going to be falling out of their chairs. Ryan Nemeth, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I am doing great. Thank you for having me. I'm very How excited. I'm really good, thanks. I'm fresh off an 11-day juice cleanse and ready to go. 11-day juice cleanse? That yeah. means you only drink juices for 11 days? It means I ate an orange at Christmas and that's pretty much it. Does that count? I think this is wild. I don't think I would be able to do that. Congratulations. What a hard yeah. thing to do. That's the only healthy thing I've eaten in 11 days. The rest has <laughs> just been complete trash. Well, you know, you got to allow yourself some trash throughout the year and the holiday season and before and after is a great time to do that. Yeah, just all year. And then that one festive orange. Have you ever read A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens? I waited for the movie to come out. Well, there's been so many of them. Mm. So I love that story and I read it every year and there's all, there's an amazing description of fruits in there and oranges and apples come up a lot and I've never found them to be so appetizing and delicious sounding as when I read that part of the book. So when you just said an orange, I thought that sounds great to me. It's only like a dessert. Yeah. They're pretty good. So <laughs> you are a, a writer, a comedian. A oh, no, no. Let's keep talking about fruit. Oh, orange. no, we're going to. Okay. This, right. this is mostly fruit based questions. Perfect. Okay, some, great. Some of the questions are going to be really juicy, I promise you. What if I just fell down and never got back? So I hope other questions are very appealing and some are going to be quite seedy. I'm trying to think of them, but I can't think of any and you're just nailing them. Yeah, I'm trying to get to the core of you as a person. Oh, man. Sorry, that one was low hanging fruit. So you do so much stuff. You've got so many talents. Can you tell me what you aspired to be when you were growing up? When I was, Yeah, sure. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a uh, a painter or a shark scientist. How did you get into sharks? I know you have a mug with a shark on it. I'm going to guess I'm wearing a shark shirt. I'm wearing some kind of a shark fin shirt right now. Um, you know, I loved them since I was a child. And I was fascinated with them. And you just mystified by them. You know, like other kids, I thought dinosaurs were very fascinating too. And then I think I just gravitated as I got older, more towards sharks. And it never stopped. And it got more and more. And I think they're incredible. And I love them. I've been to some aquariums where they have, you know, that tunnel from Jaws 3. And oh, yeah. they sort of swim overhead. It's amazing. The best. Yeah, I love those tunnels. Um, Some of the most romantic times I've ever had uh, with someone I'm dating has been uh, at a shark exhibit in an aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they, they can be very nice environments to be in. I think so. They're sort of peaceful and you get to see animals that you wouldn't normally and there's less chance of them eating you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's there's not a great chance they're going to eat you anyways, but definitely not if you're separated by the glass. Normally I'm about 20 miles inland anyway, so they can't. Oh, no chance. Yeah. No. Sarah, I have an embarrassing story about my kindergarten class when we had to go around saying what we wanted to be when we were growing up and it okay. just flashed on me. I would love to share it with you. I'd love to hear it. Well, I was very shy as a child, you know, uh, probably up until sixth or seventh grade. I didn't really um, make, a, you know, a lot of friends or become very, uh, I was just shy. I was a shy, little quiet boy. And especially when I first went off to school, so kindergarten and first and second grade, I was just mortified every day. I just wanted to be quiet and silent and just hide away and read Calvin and Hobbes comic books and draw pictures. So... In kindergarten one day, we got all in a big circle, and the teacher, Mrs. Ingold, asked us to go around and say what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I was determined to say either to be a painter or a shark person, shark scientist. And I, it was like uh, the most nerve-wracking moment of my life so far, because, you know, speaking in front of a class is terrifying. Yeah. But it could be. And one child across from me said that he wanted to be a lawyer. I don't know what that is, you know, I don't. I have no idea, it's just a word I heard maybe on TV or something, and he said that, and the teacher was like, okay, sounds good, and, you know, someone says, chef, astronaut, whatever, and uh, it was like one away from me, and I was really sweating, it. I was just, you have to speak now, where the words come out, I don't know, 
And uh, she said, Ryan, what would you like to be when you grow up? And I panicked and I said, I want to, I would like to be a lawyer. And she goes, okay. And then we moved on and I just thought, what did I do? I lied to everybody and myself. I panicked and I don't even know what a lawyer is. If she would have said why, I would have said, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I have no idea. Um, and it was mortifying. That was one of the scariest moments. And I felt massive regret for the rest of my life. I still do. It's humiliating that that happened, that I did that. Well, if you ever go to a class reunion, you can update them. Yeah, I could tell them. What I meant to say was. Everybody. Man, what a bummer. So I did not become a lawyer, as it turns out. Thank God. Would you still like to work with sharks? I would love to do that. Yes. I, uh. I've done some volunteer work, citizen science, they call it. My cousin is a, is a shark. Um, Willie is like a sea life uh, science man and tour guide and research person. And a few, I've done a few trips with him to Baja, Mexico to track, measure, and photograph whale sharks. And you just get in the water with them. You're measuring them with a piece of twine, taking photos of them. They're so big. They're like 30 feet long. And they're just wow. it's like a bus swimming next to you. So... I love doing that. And uh, yes, my answer would be yes. I would love to do that. So you studied English and art, I understand, at college and also did rugby. I didn't realize that rugby was even much of a thing in the U.S. You know, it's now more than ever. I thought it was very strange when I went out for the team in college. And then I found out that uh, high schools around my state and the rest of the country had been slowly adding rugby programs it was all new to me when I started playing I wrestled my whole life you know and when I went to Xavier University there was there's was no wrestling team and my a few of my friends said we're gonna start playing rugby and I, I didn't know what it was so I watched it a few times and I went to a few practices and I was basically just doing wrestling takedowns and suplexes to tackle people and I was working <laughs> out really well and so I played outside center for four years and I loved it. I thought it was so fun. I don't want to play ever again, but I loved it back then. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> so painful and violent, you know? Yeah, yeah. You've always loved wrestling as well. Who were your favorite wrestlers growing up? Ooh, good question. My fa my first favorite wrestler ever was Jake Roberts, Jake the Snake, because um, a, kid, a kid that lived up the street from me, I, I, I would ride bikes with him all the time. And then when he was done riding bikes... And like I said, I was very shy and quiet, so I would just go along with what anyone else was doing. So he would just go back home and put on wrestling, and I would just, you know, just march along there and sit there and watch it. And I was just mystified by this wild man who would dump a giant snake on his opponent. This was, you know, I don't, as a kid, remember moves and matches and trivia and, you know, whatever. I remember that, like a giant yeah. snake being dumped out of a, a sack. And uh, so he was he was my first favorite, definitely. And then as I got uh, more into it, you know, Kurt Angle, Billy Gunn, um, let's see, now I would say Andy Kaufman, but that probably started about a decade ago. That was that was later into Andy Kaufman. But the colorful attitude era of people that we, our dad would take us to go see in Cleveland. So, mm -hmm. and back then it just seemed like any, when any music hit, it was the greatest thing ever. It's, you know, the glass breaks. yeah suck it yeah you <laughs> suck yeah like it was just back then bam 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 hit after hit after hit yeah i used to watch british wrestling in the 1980s and then my uh -huh. friend had a sky tv cable and recorded survivor series in 1990 and it was the first time i'd ever seen what was wwf at the time it was the debut of the undertaker and there's hulk hogan ultimate warrior and all these larger than life characters big boss man legion of doom and i was just mind blown by it and would watch it every week and then jay the snake roberts my main memory of him is attacking macho man and actually being bitten by a snake so that was an extreme thing that happened those kind of moments they stick with you forever yeah. that um what you just reminded me of one there was like a seance or a mind melding like thing with the undertaker and a coffin and who is yeah. who is it was ultimate warrior maybe Papa Shango. Oh my God, dude. And this oil started dripping from his head. It was wild back I'm then. I'm still not over that. Yeah. Hey, can you imagine getting bit? I asked him about that, uh, the uh, snake bite thing. Mm. That's a great story. I'm sure he's told this story on podcast somewhere. You mentioned also Andy Kaufman. I also got into him when cause I watched Man on the Moon, the Jim Carrey biopic about him, and went back and watched his old matches with Jerry Lawler and all the promos, but also did live comedy. He did it was so good. 
Oh, yeah, so like, great. He'd read an entire book to people and then they would start fidgeting in their seats. And then he was like, would you like me to play this record instead? And it was just him reading the book. Amazing. That's <laughs> so funny. Yeah, I uh, only I mostly knew of him only as a comedian from the past, you know, and then yeah. when I got to NXT and Dr. Tom Pritchard or FCW NXT, Dr. Tom Pritchard was our head coach. And uh, after a few weeks of kind of watching me, he pulled me into the office one day and he just handed me a stack of DVDs and books. And it was all Andy Hoffman content. He said, you're going to like this. And I said, OK. And then, for uh, you know, after that weekend of just pouring over all that, my whole life, my mindset on everything creative changed after that. Definitely. If anyone watching this has not experienced Andy Kaufman, just go watch everything. Yeah, just seek it out. How about the Mighty Mouse when he sings along to Mighty Mouse on stage? Yeah. <laughs> just sings the chorus and just stands there completely still. Just stands there. He's great. So great. Very good at playing the bongos as well. Yeah, really good bongo player. Yeah, all the best wrestlers up. Yeah, that you could do a cross reference of that and it all it links up. Yeah, lines are every single time. Everyone in the Hall of Fame, tremendous at bongos. You can tell if someone's going to be good at wrestling or not right yeah. away. A pair of bongos. That's the main test. Mm -hmm. Or at least a referee because you're good at doing that. That's only if you could do it one-handed, then you'd become a referee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can't do both. <laughs> right. Am I right in understanding? You trained a Firestorm Pro in a haunted nightclub. Who said this? I think you said this. <laughs> Yes, that's uh, the Haunted Nightclub probably doesn't bill itself as a Haunted Nightclub. It's the Fantasy Theater in Lakewood, Ohio, or Cleveland, mm -hmm. Ohio. It is a very old theater, and way up top, there's a, I don't know, maybe where a projector used to be or something. There's a little office room there, and the very old door has a string of bullet holes in it which I find to be exciting and spooky a little bit. And I just thought, why has this not been replaced in 80 or 90 years, you know? So I would uh, sneak in there, well, I sneak in there. They would give me the key and I would go at nighttime to just run the ropes and take back bumps and just roll around and get used to the ring. Yeah. And when my brother would be in town, he would go with me and teach me how to tie up and do other things. But we would always, whether I was alone or with him, at some point, you you'd get little. Your hairs would stand up in your, and you'd go like, nah, "I think we should get out of here." And I would sometimes hear a note. I would hear like the footsteps on the stairs and stuff, or you just feel someone watching you somewhere. And uh, I would tell this to the people who ran the place, and they would say, "Oh yeah, it's definitely haunted. We should have told you that." And I'm like, "Oh God, I don't want to know that." You know, uh, to leave, you had to turn the light off. And then there's a giant hallway that took 30 or 40 seconds to walk down before you got to the door to the outside. And we would always go at night, late night. So you would have to be like, okay, ready? Shut the light off and then kind of just speed walk and just go, don't look, don't look, don't look. And then finally feel your way to the door. And then you felt like, okay, fine. You can lock the door. But it was a scary final stretch of darkness to walk through in a place that you think is haunted. And so I was thinking about this and it occurred to me that you were actually in the real spirit squad. I was never in the Spirit Squad. No, no, no. Because no. it was haunted. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, that's Spirit Squad. That's the actual one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I interpreted it the wrong way because so many people think that I was literally in the Spirit Squad. I bet. No, but you're in the real one, though. Because yes, the, the actual the, one. The hauntings and the perfectness. Spirits Squad. So you made your TV debut in Ohio Valley Wrestling against Paradise, who later became your tag team partner, and you became champions. So that was exciting. That was very fun. He yeah. is now, I think he's been working as a producer for WWE for uh, five or seven years or something. Yeah, he works with NXT, is that right? Pretty sure, mostly NXT. Yeah. I get to see him every, maybe once or twice a year. Sometimes we'll, our schedules will intersect in the same city. It's always a nice reunion. Great guy. Taught me a lot. You signed a developmental deal with WWE and debuted for Florida Championship Wrestling as Briley Pierce. Can you tell us where that name came from? Absolutely. Um, I love the name Pierce. And so I was coming up with all these names, first name Pierce, 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 you know, and I could not think of a first name. And uh, the owner of Ohio Valley Wrestling, Danny Davis, his real life last name is Briley. And I think maybe Joey Mercury, who was uh, coaching us at the time from Eminem, 
he said, what about Briley? That'd be kind of fun, right? And I thought, Briley, Briley Pierce. Yeah, okay, I like it. And so I submitted that. And one night I was eating dinner with Damian Sandow, Aaron Stevens, and I got a text from the office that said, Nathan Pierce or Briley Pierce, which one do you want? And I said, Briley, definitely. And I thought it was a really fun first name and no one else had it. Yeah. And it really liked it. It was uh, so different and strange. And it was kind of like Ryan, you know, that I sound, Rye. Yeah. Ryan. So I love, I like, I kept it. I liked it. A secret way to show respect to uh, the place I came from, OVW. Your first match in Florida Championship Wrestling in 2011 was against Big E Langston. Did you know stepping into the ring with him, he was going to be a big star one day? Um, that's a great question. So that was my first televised match. I've had a right. lot of yeah, yeah. there uh, before that. I knew that. Well, yeah, I guess he would definitely be in my list of people I would say would be big stars. But then I thought that about, a hand, you know, many people. And then sometimes someone decides they won't be or they decide they won't be or whatever. But I was fortunate enough to be in like a really great group of uh, wrestlers there. I mean, the entire Wyatt family, Luke Harper, Roman Reigns, uh, all of the Shield, Big E, Xavier Woods. Just Charlotte, Flair, uh, so many amazing wrestlers who have gone to be giant stars. You never know. You know, FCW was kind of like the Wild West. They would just hire whoever and just see what happened. And yeah, yeah I'm glad things have worked out really well for him. Uh, and whatever he does after right now, I know he's got a neck thing happening, I think. Mm. He'll be fine. You know, like he'll either be wrestling or acting or or a personality in wrestling or whatever. He's just such a star. That's amazing. Um, that was not going through my mind during that match. During that match, I was mostly getting the um, shit kicked out of me. So I wasn't thinking about that at the time. <laughs> Always a problem. More immediate issues to deal with. Yeah. Exactly. Do you ever have that before a match where you're just nervous about the person? If they're huge, you're just a bit more worried about it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I often uh, have been put in the predicament of uh, being a medium sized, cocky guy that will be beat up by a much larger giant man. And so I often have that feeling. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm at. Big Shay once. Yeah, I took a choke slam from him two months ago. It was choke slams, I think, are the most painful. No matter yeah. who they're from, you know, like that, you just can't not, it just hurts, you know. Yeah, you're picked up by your neck. It's not good. And then slammed from if the person is real tall. I mean, I was I watched a video of him choke slamming me, and he's a very safe, kind wrestler, uh, a real pro. But you can't get around the fact that you're just how tall is that man? I'm up seven feet in the air, just getting Slam to the ground, it hurts. It's a problem. Unless you start wrestling in space and then you'll come down a bit slower. If we can only get there sooner. We're waiting on NASA to do this. We could start a petition. I yeah. can stand around. Imagine the luchadors. They'd be like 100 foot in the air. Amazing. You'd never see them again. Nice. Point. Massive problem. Yeah. They'd have to be attached to the floor in some way. Every 75 years, you get to see Rey Mysterio come do a loop and then <laughs> right back out there. Then takes out a satellite by accident. <laughs> so you spent some time at NXT. What was that experience like? I understand you preferred perhaps your first half of your time there. Now, why would you say that? Have I also said this somewhere else? You might have. <laughs> I did prefer my first half um, big time. The first half I was, uh, you know, in really fun matches with people like Dean Ambrose, Claudio Cesaro, Sandow, you know, tag team champion of the territory uh, on their TV show all the time on every match, super or every show. Uh, and if I wasn't wrestling, I was factored in some other way. Like, hey, can you host this? Can you do whatever? You know, I, was, um, I had certain talents and skills and they were being utilized and I was learning and, you know, I was in the, the top class, you know, they had classes and I was in the main one. We had a, uh, an FCW NXT top 10. I think I got third for a few months. That was pretty cool. I was tied with tied at third place, and I felt great, you know. You know, that feels pretty cool when you see, like, Seth Rollins and whoever else, one and two, and then Bradley Pierce. I felt like, whoa, dude, I'm, like, coming along here. Yeah, it's amazing. Dusty Rhodes loved our tag team. He was, like, uh, 
you know, in the midst of pitching us to go up to SmackDown and stuff. Yeah. And then someone else took over and thought that I sucked. And that was that. And that's just how entertainment goes. You know, that's probably everywhere in show business, but especially in something like wrestling, which is like a little bit of show business, a little bit of uh, athleticism and a little bit of carnival and other things. If someone's in charge and they just don't like you, that's it. Maybe you can do something about it, but maybe you can't. And I couldn't. And so my life moved on. That's all. I understand you're also a writer on Swerved. I wrote uh, on Swerved, yes. Yeah. If you could prank anyone in the world, who would it be? I love being pranked. Mm. But that's not really answering your question, is it? Uh, Unless you want to set up an elaborate prank for yourself that you then forget about through the medium of hypnosis. (laughs) I have accidentally pranked myself a few times. (laughs) Um, I've, I have forgotten about something and then t- of course I've done that uh, I think Matt Cardona Zack Ryder is the best person to prank and if you've watched the first season of Swerved you'll know that and if you haven't go find it somewhere because there is a prank on that first episode or the first season that is so funny there's an electrified chair that he thinks he's doing an interview for the WWE Network or something and he keeps getting shocked and he's just flipping out and like losing his mind and uh, he ne- he takes him so long to catch on that it's a prank, you know. <laughs> he just keeps sitting on it and getting shocked and shocked. And the the people that made that show, uh, Jeff Tremaine and some of his uh, friends from Jackass and all that. So he is just he is the best at pranks. And so being in that writers' room was so fun. I would love coming up with ideas for ways to, to prank people. And um, there was a time, maybe for two or three years after that, anytime I would see Matthew Cardona in public or at a wrestling show or an event, or I would show up to TV, he would see me and he would, his eyes would go like this and he'd go, what's going on? What's, why are you here? What are you doing here? Are you going to prank me? Is there like a a shock (laughs) thing somewhere? (laughs) And I was like, no, I'm just visiting, man. Yeah. That was such a funny episode. I've watched it a few times over the years and. Oh, you, okay, great, great. Yeah. yeah, I've I've seen all of it. Yeah. You moved to LA and you started doing stuff with Second City. You did a Venmo mm-hmm. commercial, an Xfinity commercial with Amy Poehler. I interviewed her brother, Greg, which was fun. Have you got a favorite experience from that time when you first moved there? Let's see. Um, just getting to be on stages and in shows at Upright Citizens Brigade and Second City was really meaningful to me uh, and so fun. It felt so natural and it felt like uh, r- joyful. I was very happy doing all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, second city closed down here after uh corona pandemic time and ma- massive bummer but there you know the other theaters are here um i did a commercial for venmo in which there were miniature horses and i got to spend 12 hours in vancouver connecticut or sorry connecticut vancouver british columbia canada uh shooting a commercial with miniature horses and i thought it was so fun and i I loved how it all came out and they started airing them during the world series and there would be billboards at the world series good timing for that and a lot of my friends in chicago were saying you're on a billboard with a pony is that you and i was like yeah that's me man. <laughs> so venmo's original commercial campaign i was one of the stars of that and i uh, think that was very fun that was really exciting for me it came on during The Simpsons, which is my favorite TV show. And so I was watching The Simpsons and then that came on and I just stood up in the living room and thought, this is pretty cool. And have you been tempted to purchase a miniature horse since that? No, I think, you know, having and raising a horse is beyond my uh, desires and, and practical capabilities. I don't have room for it, you know. I think if you had the room, you'd probably go shark first, right? Oh, that's a tricky question because I don't really want to confine a shark to just my house, you know? You could live next to the ocean. Sure. Yeah. If I if I just live near the ocean, a shark visited me every day and we were buddies, that'd be great. That'd be cool. Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to see if I can make that happen for you. Thank you. You also worked on an episode of AP Bio and you're also a wrestling consultant in it as well. Is it a challenge when actors don't have any wrestling experience or if it comes to them actually wrestling, would there be a stunt double? for those moves uh it is a challenge and it's a very fun challenge and for a couple of years before i got involved with AEW, that's what i was doing was yeah. mostly working on tv and film and music video sets that involve wrestling in some way and and uh training actors to do certain moves and then finding stunt doubles who were wrestlers and it was really fun yeah i got to be a wrestling consultant on a number of projects 
Um, and during that same time frame, I got to be on Glow, the season of Glow that never aired. So that was kind of it was very exciting and fun, and then it never aired. So it was. Did they not, film that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Oh, wow. I, my character was uh, what was my name? Is an Italian guy. Tony Maroney. That's that was my character. I had gold chains, slick back hair, and I was uh, a wrestler guy. Uh, it was super fun time period. Let's see. I did something similar. I worked a lot with Chavo Guerrero, you know, on things like Heel. We had him as the wrestling coordinator on Heel, my short film. And he was on Glow as well, obviously, as the fights coordinator. And on Iron Claw, which just came out. Uh, well, I don't know when this will air, but Iron Claw came out uh, Christmas time, 2020. Yeah. And He'll be it's... after that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be probably streaming in a month or so. So maybe it's streaming right now. Go watch it. Any day that I was not personally working on Iron Claw in the ring, but they were doing matches and I was there for the for the three weeks I was there, I would go to the ring every day and just help because just what you mentioned, actors are not wrestlers, you know? So even if they've trained for a few months, there's still things that just are, will seem strange and they don't want to do. And so... The one I was around most for that I was not part of was the Harley, big Harley race match. That was like a big challenge. You had two actors, you had two stunt doubles, and you had to get a version of the match with every combination of that. So actor, 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 stunt double, stunt double, stunt double, stunt double, actor. And that was like an all day thing. Wow. It was, I think it came out so great. That's maybe my favorite part of the movie is that match. I think it was so amazing. Zach Efron crushed it. That man... Did a really incredible job. I think, and I think Iron Claw is the best depiction of pro wrestling I've ever seen in a film or TV production ever, hands down, case closed, definitely. It's not out in the UK yet, outrageously. But all the scenes I've seen of it look phenomenal. Okay. Um, the short film that you wrote and starred in, Hill. Yeah. Really powerful, absolute must watch. Congratulations on that. Really important Thank conversation about sexual assault in indie wrestling. At the time, uh, I felt very passionately about making a piece of art that dealt with it because, you know, I was just a little bit privately anguishing over certain scenarios that I was just aware of and couldn't mm. do anything about. And so... I was just kind of talking with my girlfriend and and friends who are, you know, artists and filmmakers and saying like, well, you just, there's a certain time you can't, I can't go out and publicly go, hello, I'd like to report all of these things to everybody. You can't do that for legal reasons and for the reasons of whoever has confided in you does not want that to happen. I mean, there's, some, I will also say since Heal has come out every couple months, someone will start, try to start an online thing against me saying I, I uh, took advantage of women's stories or something like that. And I'll just think, what, is, what are you getting out of trying to create this little narrative online? I didn't try to do anything except make a movie that uh, caused people to think about something. You know, that was the yeah. point of it. When I brought the script to Maggie Levin, who ended up wanting to direct it, which I was very grateful for, I said, what do you think about this? You know, like... We're not out here making a documentary. We're not out here exposing any actual events from reality. What we're doing is writing a script that deals with some things that a lot of people will be familiar with and that I personally am just aware of in the world of wrestling. I know it's everywhere, but... Um, and then, you know, while we were editing it and during post-production, the Me Too movement basically happened in wrestling. And I thought, well this is a lot bigger than I thought it was. And this movie probably will resonate with a lot more people than I thought it would. And we did not intend to give an answer or a solution or anything at all. We just wanted to present what I wanted to do is say, this is how complicated it is. And the, the act, the, the role I played is not a hero at all, by any means. He is uh, depicting one person, one character's, you know, solution that ends up being bad for everybody i mean there is no it's blurry it's complicated it's upsetting and uh it sucks and i wanted to just show that on screen in a short film and it did really well and it won a bunch of yeah. awards 
screened in so many different countries. I'm really, really grateful for everybody who helped out with it. Yeah. I was a little long winded then. Sorry. I'm very passionate about no, it. No, 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 absolutely. And so it's such a powerful film, honestly, and everyone should watch it. It's so tricky. And I wanted, I didn't want it to be like, I'm Ryan Nemeth, a straight white guy, and here's what I think about everything. And so that's why I, I think it was great to have Maggie as a as the kind of, you know, captain of the ship, so to speak, directing it. And we made a point to try to fill out the cast and crew with what's like the funny way to put this, as few of me as possible. So we, so we, we literally just said... What if we don't hire and cast all straight white Ryan Nemeth people? And then we re realized how easy that was. And we were, that, we kind of made that a side goal of like, let's have a di very diverse cast and crew here. And I love what we came up with. And I love the finished product. And I am just eternally grateful to everybody who made that happen. Your performance and also the writing were excellent. Well, I think that's very kind. Thank you very much. It's just Drake. I'm just relieved I didn't have to say it was terrible because that would have been awkward. There are other things you've watched in mind that were very bad. <laughs> that actually isn't. I've enjoyed everything I've watched of yours, which is a huge <laughs> relief when you spend a week re-watching everyone's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I only invite people on my show if I love everything that they do because I'm going to shine a spotlight on it and celebrate stuff that I've enjoyed. It's kind of my well, way of saying the, thank you. Is, if you're able to choose your own guests, that's a nice luxury then. Yeah, pretty much. And there's been over 250 of them now. So I'm, I'm grateful for everyone that comes on my show. And yeah, it's just, it's a good time. Damn, 250. Keep it rolling. This is something I love as well. You first got into AEW because I understand you were visiting somebody, happened to have your ring gear with you, and then ended up in a match with Hangman Adam Page. That's uh, just how it goes in wrestling. I would uh, never show up to an event without my gear and... That was the more, most uh, fortuitous of those ever in my life, yeah. I was going to say happy birthday to um, little Brody Jr., negative one, because uh, I think Trent Beretta and, and Luchasaurus both messaged me and said, hey, we're going to do a little birthday party for him. It would probably be nice if you came. And when he was real tiny, I used to babysit him here and there, not weekly, but, you know, when yeah. they would want him a date night or something i would help babysit and i remember right when i saw him i said hey happy birthday remember me and he just looked at me and goes no <laughs> <laughs> which i thought was so funny because obviously why would he? he was like so long ago and he was a tiny little kid then he grew to know the the current me and uh yeah that was a really fun time and I ended up having a match with Hangman Adam Page, which was just very, very, very unexpected. But I was ready. You were ready. I almost had him. That close. Close, yeah. Man, that's my dad's favorite wrestler, Adam Page. Oh, really? That's outrageous. I tell him all the time. <laughs> and we got him to finally meet him when we had um, Dynamite and Rampage in Cleveland a couple of years ago. I mean, it was one year ago. My parents came, and I was like, oh, my God, you have to meet Adam Page. And then I got them to take a photo together. That was pretty awesome. I understand why you have to have your ring gear with you the whole time. Because every time I've ever watched wrestling, there's backstage segments where people are just getting attacked and it just leads from point to yeah. matches. So you just have yeah. to be ready the whole time. Yeah, I'd be ready all the time. And you yeah. might, I used to, when I would go to OVW, I would put my ring gear on and then put my my jeans on because I, maybe it was that mindset. I, I didn't get changed there. I would just take off the, the pants and be ready to go, which all the other members of the roster thought was so funny. But I was just thinking, I have a day job at this point. I have other things to do. Like, I need to just go. I'm going coming here from two other places, you know. But they just thought it was funny. Like, what are you, Superman? You just have your <laughs> little shorts on all the time. But I did, you know. I have that just in case I'm ever hired as an acrobat or something. I have several costumes underneath my normal clothes. And then several? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have loads of ambitions. Astronaut, I've got a fool I can just float off. Yeah. It's great, yeah. Uber, doctor, surgeon. It's similar clothes for them, thankfully. Well, that's good. That's convenient. It is, although I do have some around winter options. You could go skiing. You could go sand dune riding. They do something with sand dunes, don't they? People? Every day. Battling giant worms normally. Sandworms, yeah, like beetles. Yeah. The only problem is I have to have my house extremely cold because I'm sometimes wearing up to 45 outfits just in case. 
Oh, yeah. Wow. In a constant state of readiness. Like this? I'm yeah. To... Jerry and friends just wearing all the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you started working at AEW and indeed Ring of Honor. You're now the Hollywood hunk. What have been your favorite experiences? Oh, I've had some very fun moments. Um, I got some some of my most fun moments are not literally in wrestling matches. So there's one match, I think I was on the outside managing and Sting chased me out of the entire arena in Jacksonville with a baseball bat. And I just thought that was the coolest shit ever. Amazing. I that to me is was like so huge. I, that was one where I would like text and my whole family and be like, "You're not gonna believe what I just did." You know? <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, dang, what else? You know, I've had a lot of fun on the uh, dark and elevation, which aren't around anymore. I had so many fun matches against the uh, the best friends in Dark Order, which were super fun. I love anytime I was wrestling in any capacity against Trent Beretta was like some of my favorite times ever. Billy Gunn. It's almost too many to, to mention. A lot of good times, fun times. I love doing interviews with Dasha and Lexi. Love those. Those are those are some of my most fun times. Yeah. If you could wrestle anybody, past or present, in any kind of match at any event with any stipulation you like, what would it be? That's a hard one. Wrestling Kurt Angle would be so fun, wouldn't it? What would the stipulation be? Milk on a pole match? Milk on a pole. What if you like pull some kind of a string and the milk just comes pouring down? That would be yeah. pretty good. And what about my brother and I? Can I wrestle him in some kind of, you know, I've only wrestled him in a tag team match in NXT. I've never had a one on one with him, singles with him. Although I like to tag with him against a number of teams. How about this? How about the Hardys, the Young Bucks, the Gun Club, and the Nemeth Brothers? Is that four teams? Yeah. And the winner. Gets Billy Gunn. He's just up. He's just the prize. <laughs> gets him in what capacity? You just get to have him. He's just, just our guy. He just moves in. Yeah, <laughs> we all we all move in together. <laughs> I think that'd be good. Well, he gets to be our like human teddy bear. Yeah. So the the first step on that journey is Kurt Angle in a milk match, and then <laughs> Fatal Four Way Tag Team, and then you go home with Billy Gunn. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty fun um, day. We're going to do this on one day? Yeah, okay, okay. why not? Yeah. Sure. I'll record it on one day. You can release it multiple weeks, but... Sure, tape it on one day. Just... You've got that momentum going. We're already warmed up, why not? Yeah, you've already just defeated Kurt Angle. People will see the, the tag team match and say, why is one of those guys covered in milk? <laughs> <laughs> That's what helps you win, ultimately. The arena smells so bad. <laughs> Everyone that tries to pin you just flies straight off. Yeah. Cats are following me around, meowing. <laughs> I really need to see this now. Cows outside protesting. Yeah. I personally would love to see that. Then I think we should do it. Somehow, somewhere. Got tickets to AEW next August. Maybe make that the main event. You already got tickets? Wow, you're one of the people that are like getting those numbers real big. I went to the big NXT pay-per-view a year or two ago, whenever my brother was NXT champ and had that match with, yeah. um, you know, what's his name? Ron Breaker? Breaker, Breaker. Yeah. yeah, serious. I loved the match and I thought he was great and I just blanked on everybody's name. Uh, yeah, that was a really fun match. Very super fun match. That's a fun show. That'll be yeah. a good one. The only thing I've planned to do is do that, have a Philly cheesesteak and run up the Rocky steps afterwards, I think. I had a Philly cheesesteak there one time. Pretty good recommend it well that's not my favorite kind of a food kind of What's sandwich. Your favorite food oh. wow let's see it's not giant sub sandwiches or those kind of things like that's just not for me my favorite kind of food i don't know i really like ice cream i like gelato i like sushi i like um you know i like uh chicken parmesan that's good i like fruits a lot like we were talking about earlier raspberries Watch please it gets. I like it all, but Philly cheesesteaks, not my favorite thing. You know, it was fine. It was okay. All right. I just yeah. don't want any more of them. <laughs> I was so pleased to see you at New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom 18 recently with your brother Nick. Can you tell me how that came about? Uh well, I can tell you some things. I can tell you that we were invited to watch a few matches in the mm. front row as American dignitaries. And 
Uh, I love the show. I had never been to an environment like that before, ever. I um, have been to very large events and large wrestling shows and large, you know, football, basketball thing. I'd never, nothing like that ever. That is a very unique fandom and culture there in Japan uh, with pro wrestling. And I yeah. recommend everybody at some point somehow try to get involved and watch one of those incredible athletes there. And uh, we saw some amazing matches, tag team title matches. We saw some singles matches. We saw just a wild match with um, Osprey, Moxley, and Finley. And unfortunately, there's a little riffraff after that match. And uh, like any brother, had to have his back. But I think he was going a little off the rails. So I had to pull him up back a little bit. And I don't know if it was to shown in any clips, but after that, uh, Nick ran after him again and then jumped on him and punched him in the back of the head and I had him you know, in front of all the fans and at that point I said what are you doing we're guests at this show we're guests in this country I don't want to get thrown in federal Japanese prison so I thought things were calmed down and then there was a press conference and he attacked Finley again so I don't know <laughs> uh, I'm glad my suit didn't tear that would have been bad that would have been bad you know but it was an honor to be part of that event uh, I look forward to seeing what happens in the future with uh, Nick Nemeth and New Japan Pro Wrestling. And if I can ever be of assistance, then I would love to be. And if not, that's fine. I hope to see you there again soon. Great country. I had a great time there. And uh, we launched the Wanted Man short film right after that all went down. And uh, I was very happy to add Japanese subtitles on YouTube. So if you're if you speak Japanese... If that's your first language and you're watching this, check out Wanted Man on YouTube and click the subtitles button. We have we have you covered. Amazing short film. Thank you. Lots of zombies. How did that come about? Well, um, we love Evil Dead and Kurt Russell <laughs> also and movies like that. And uh, he wanted to, you know, we're both creative. We like making things. And so he said, I'm pretty free at the moment. Maybe we should make something and uh, find a good time to debut it. And a lot of things all lined up at the same time, and including him uh, rebranding himself as Nick Nemeth, the wanted man. And Downstate has crafted an amazing song, which I think in a few weeks they'll be uh, putting up on wherever they put music up. And a lot of things all just converged at once, uh, including Maggie, who directed Wanted Man being available. I kind of pitched the idea to her. I said, hey, Nick and I want to do this thing. Do you have any interest mm -hmm. in it? And she was like, absolutely, 100%, yes. And that's perfect because I'm not shooting anything, you know, this month. And it was kind of a sibling thing because Nick and myself are brothers and her brother, Jake, helped produce it. And so it was a nice little family affair here making that project. And... It has gotten a really nice response so far. So thank you to everyone who's been watching that and commenting and sharing it. Uh, a few horror magazine websites have been doing pieces on it, and that's been great too. So yeah, that's that's it was awesome making that. But it was hard to keep it a secret because we shot it a yeah. few months ago. We just been having to like <laughs> be very quiet about it this whole time. It's really well done, and I thank really you. recommend that everyone watches it. Can you confirm for me? Was it you that had your head kicked off? Uh, yes, that was me who had my head kicked off. I'm glad that it's been repaired. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the stitches. It was, it's, uh, but it's back on. It's most, yeah, it mostly stays on. It falls off from time to time, but I just snap it back on. Yeah, I mean it's on backwards, but apart from that, they did a great job. <laughs> it's not backwards. Oh no! <laughs> it was awesome. Maggie directed it. Um, her brother helped produce it. Anna Lori helped produce uh, a lot and prepare a lot and. I uh, did, I, I wrote it, Maggie rewrote it, and we cast it. It was fun, great, really great team. Just a lot of very lucky things all lining up at the same time. And how long did it take to film? You're not going to believe this. We shot the whole thing in one day. Oh, wow. Which I just saw a, a tweet, I think I reposted it, uh, Scott Derrickson, uh, you know, well-known horror director. Yeah. He said, uh, I can't believe this was all shot in one day. And I thought, man, that's that's some pretty high praise coming from the guy who made Doctor Strange and Emily Rose. Own, Emily Rose, uh, Sinister. That I thought I felt pretty freaking cool about that one. Yeah. Watch it a million times. Share it with <laughs> me. 
If you know anyone that likes scary movies, send it to them. It really reminded me of kind of like 80s action. It's really good. Perfect. That's exactly what we're going for. Thank you. I'm glad. I need to see a full movie of this. Me too. That'd be great. And just have your head keep regrowing for some reason. So just throughout the film, it gets kicked off. When that special effects shot got sent to me secretly, I just could not stop watching it over and over again. And I was just like, this is, people are going to love this. People are going to love a super chick exploding ahead. Great. So, so good. So here's a question I ask every guest on the Sarah O'Connell show. Can you tell me a fun fact about you? Something we may not know, a hobby, a party trick, something like that. A fun fact about me. Mm. What's a fun fact about me? You know, I, uh, I'm i going to tell you a fact and you tell me if it's, if it's fun or not. Okay. Lifelong, when I have blood drawn or get a shot of some kind of injection, I will pass out before, during, or afterwards. But uh, for the past year and a half, I have avoided that. I have... Uh, done special techniques to not faint <laughs> so for me that's really fun i don't know if that's fun for you that's amazing that's a big deal congratulations thank you very much it's but yeah it's so hard uh but i this trick that i've done and i'll tell if anyone else has this issue my trick that i do is if you're at, at the medical place if they can somehow have the table go this way so your head is down and your feet are upward the blood kind of pulls in your head and so I'll feel the feeling of what it feels like to pass out, but I won't pass out because yeah. it won't let me. So I'll recognize that my body is trying to faint right now, but it physically can't. And so that's nice. It's nice to not faint. For some reason, that reminds me of an episode of 24, where I can't remember if it was Jack Bauer or someone else was being tortured. And I kept them upside down so they didn't pass out. Wow. Yeah, that, that position has some name. And I remember when I finally tried it and it worked i told one of my doctors and they they said like oh yeah duh the whatever position and i thought why didn't you tell me this you're, you're what all of these years you never mentioned this to me so we used to have blood taken a lot at nxt and fcw and i would just be so humiliated to just pass out in front of everybody and norman smiley would uh often squeeze he would say squeeze my hand and just don't think about it and he was up so whenever i get blood taken i always text him and i say hey man <laughs> And then he'll, whenever NXT is blood day, he'll text me and say, blood day today, thinking of you. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's our uh, our bond. But yeah, that's an amazing thing, though. So, yeah, congratulations. Thank you. So that, for me, is a fun fact. I hope it's fun for, I hope it helps somebody else. I think it will. There's probably tons of stuff like that, that stuff you go through in life that sucks, and there's just an easy way of fixing it. Well, there's always someone who, when they learn that I, I have that problem, they'll say, well, just don't look. And I'll just think, I'm a grown man who's been alive for several decades. You think that I've never tried not looking? Also, I've never looked. I have never looked. It doesn't matter. You're like, you're not going to solve this problem right now. All right, thanks. So you mentioned it earlier, The Iron Claw, huge movie. You played Gino Hernandez in the film Real Life Wrestler. Can you tell me how you first got involved? I understand you heard you got the role while you were on a plane. Yeah, I heard I, it was, uh, they made the offer while I was on the plane. Um, I got uh, an audition, you know, just like anything else from my manager. And I was visiting Atlanta at the time. My girlfriend was filming Gotham Nights, the TV show. So she was living there for six months. So I was with her when I got to casting and we, we shot the audition tape together and I sent it in and I hoped I got the part, but you never know. Like you just have to send it in and just forget about it and move on. Otherwise you go crazy, you know? And there was never a callback or anything. I was just flying to, I think I was flying to an AEW TV show, I think. And I got Wi-Fi on the plane. And I guess my manager had been trying to call me, but nope, it wasn't going through. <laughs> Excuse me, because I was flying. And so he thought I was just ignoring his calls. And he said, it was like, check your email right now, please. We need to confirm. They're, they made an offer. And it was it was like the, the, ling the language of someone who had, been being ignored for a few hours but i was like what is this is the first i'm hearing of this oh shit sorry uh let me check in and it was like please here's our offer to play the role of gino hernandez well i know the details and i was just like really excited but also panicking because i thought i was getting yelled at by my manager well, you know it was good news but i was like oh, 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 yes yes confirm yes <laughs> so it was exciting and thrilling 
Yeah, of course. And how did you go about preparing for that role? Obviously, you could watch his matches back. Did you have the opportunity to speak to anybody that knew him at the time? Um, I tried to. I tried to do that. Well, I, I watched anything I could find on him. Every match, every promo, every interview, read everything I could about him, listened to any podcast about him. And I think there were a few people I spoke to who were contemporaries of him or, or knew him a little bit. Um, so I would ask anyone that's in my network, you know, I asked Rip Rogers, I asked Ric Flair, whoever, you know, and anything I can get from anybody, uh, was useful. But at the end of the day, you can't just go in and do an impersonation or impression of somebody, which I, no one wants that to happen. You know, yeah. um, if you watch the Iron Claw, you see uh, in a, a cast doing amazing performances, but no one is doing an impression of someone, which I think right. is great. You want to see an impression, go watch an impression. That's not what the movie is, you know? And so I, so it was hard. You had, I had to be myself, but I had to be this persona. And uh, mostly if I were doing his mannerisms or something like that, it would be in the, in the ring. And so it's, it's tricky because we shot so much wrestling. And, and then when you see the final product, you're like, Wow, I wrestled and took all those bumps and this much got put in the movie. But that's just how it is with everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So if there's ever a, a deleted scenes, Gino Hernandez uh, released by A24, I'd love to see that. But I was very proud of what I did. Uh, I was very prepared. And I was doing things that he did in the ring. You know, uh, I would I would tweak it all to make it Gino. And I remember when I rapped on all the wrestling, when I was finally done the director sean durkin came up to me pulled me aside and said ryan you brought gino hernandez to this film and i want to thank you and i just felt like goosebumps you know like i felt so proud of that moment it was i felt this is what i'm supposed to be doing some whatever this feeling is i need to have this as much as i can and so that was it was a great experience i'm very happy i was able to be part of that did you enjoy the period setting yes very much i, I love the hair i love the clothing the wardrobe Every day when uh, Natalie took my hair off, I was very bummed out. And she's up for all these awards right now for the hair design of the film. And I think that's really great. She it was so good. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't stop taking selfies and looking in the mirror. And, and uh, I love the Gino hair. It was like my favorite thing ever. Did you get to keep any props or souvenirs from that production at all? No, no, no. I wish. I wish I had the, the hair and the clothing. But maybe I can grow it out, you know? Yeah, Someday. you should. Yeah, definitely. If they went back to that era and maybe did like a, a TV show, would you be happy to revisit the character and explore his life even more? Big time. Definitely. A hundred percent. Yes. He is such a, his life story is so interesting and tragically short and full of mystery and intrigue and darkness and, promise and potential yes i think that would be an amazing character to uh, to explore further yes definitely from what i've seen of behind the scenes stuff it seems like zach kefron really immersed himself in that role what did you think about him in the ring and do you think he should try and have a match for real one day um i thought the first day when i showed up for stunts rehearsal I was nervous and I walked in and saw him with his arms folded watching uh, uh, a big flat screen and he was watching some Von Erich's tag team match. I thought, this is awesome. He is fully like, he didn't know anyone was looking at him. He was just like doing, you know, basically tape study like any other wrestler would do. And, uh, and he took everything very seriously. He asked questions. He was very safe if he if he didn't feel comfortable doing something he would just say it and usually he was comfortable doing it um i have to give him all the credit in the world for just creating taking a real life person who's literally still alive and uh making a, an amazing piece of artwork out of it i think he crushed it physically and artistically and i gotta give credit to uh harris dickinson he just the same thing i would say ditto for him and one of his, there's an amazing drop kick that Harris throws that makes it into the film. Cause you never know what's going to make it in and what's not going to make it in. Right. Yeah. And he had an amazing drop kick one day. And I said, man, I hope they use that. And they did. And it looks so sick and it's great. Uh, the whole cast is awesome. Lily, Jeremy Allen White, uh, Holt. Uh, you got to see this movie. Iron Claw is the best depiction of pro wrestling. Like I said, 
uh, in and out of the ring. I should add that as as the to be more specific. Very happy to be part of it. If you could bring any other wrestler's story to life, who would it be? Bring wrestler stories to life. Yeah. I, don't know. I, I guess my response to that would be if something like The Iron Claw was made into a series that just stretched it out. Because it's an amazing film, but it's two hours and it's over. Right. And that's just that's decades of things happening. I'd like to see the whole Dallas territory uh world class just you know make it a 10 episode series that that would be amazing to me to watch all of the that whole cast of characters there now i need to move over to a short film that i saw you in daddy's boys it's hilarious so so uh, good well thank you so much uh yeah well my brother and i like making things together and usually it's me thinking of some goofy premise and then uh <laughs> we just do it so that one, that got into a few film festivals. Uh, seeing that on the big screen was pretty cool. You know, that should be my answer when you asked me earlier, what was a fun early L.A. memory? Making that out of the seed of a little joke that I thought of and writing the script, shooting it, and then fast forward to seeing it on a literal movie screen in a movie theater was, that is a huge highlight for me. It's so funny confirming you're definitely not robot. I am not a robot. No, so you do have a reattachable head, but it's organic. This is organic matter. Yeah, nothing, nothing metal or tubes or wires or anything like that. And they've done a great job. Thank you. Check uh, my YouTube channel. That's where all these things are. Daddy's boys, wanted man, heel. They're all on uh, Ryan Nemeth YouTube. Ryan Ryan Nem Nem. Certainly is. I've watched every single thing on your YouTube channel and subscribed and recommend that everyone else does as well. Did I subscribe back? I I don't know. I'll check and I'll do it. We'll make sure. I hope so. You should definitely yeah. subscribe because there's an interview with your brother on my channel and you're about to be on there too. I got to get on there. Yeah. You what should. am I missing? Yeah. Dude. Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle. We're going to get that milk match to happen. That would be just my dream. Well, what else? What else do you want to know? In addition to that, I've been doing a comedy stand-up tour with your brother and a bunch of other people. I was <laughs> really excited to find out, by the way, that Jenna Friedman was part of your show. She's been on my show as well. Wow. She's one of my favorite uh, writers. And yeah, amazing. And comedians. I think I've sent her book, her new book, to someone as a gift. Not funny. It's a very funny book. Great book. Did you read the book? Oh, you probably did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw that she was looking to get back on stages. She just was feeling better about having a baby and like going out and stuff. And she said, Hey, I'm looking to work on some material if anyone has shows. And I thought, I'm just going to like take a wild swing here and send a message. And I said, we have Hunkamania at the comedy store. It's a wrestling fan crowd, but we would, you're like my favorite. It would be amazing if you're on it. Just think about it. And she said, let's do it. And she did it and she was awesome and crushed. And it was so cool to have her on the show. Yeah. That's so great. Do you think you might be doing more of those kind of shows in 2024? Uh, yes, I do. And we linked up with a, a touring company, Real Good Touring, and they helped uh, with some of that. And it was cool. I just have to uh, see you. I just got to let my brother settle a little bit. He's in a little state of flux and figuring out some dates and a lot of appearances and stuff. So once that's all kind of laid out, then I'd like to. I, I have stuff on my own I've been doing. And this weekend, I'm going to New York City to perform at The Stand on a show. I don't know if this will air. That it, So I hope I crushed. We'll see. <laughs> but I'm sure you will. Thank you. I do a lot of live comedy, and it's fun doing it with him. And Hunkamania will continue, yes. Can you tell me what you like to do in your spare time? Have you got any favorite TV shows? I know you mentioned The Simpsons, and you're at one point painting dogs. Yes, I love drawing and painting. I love to draw with ink and paint with watercolor. Yeah. Uh, I love watching documentaries about outer space and about the ocean and also the Great Lakes. There's an amazing documentary uh, on the formation of the Great Lakes, which I think is just so interesting. So I like to read. Dracula is my favorite novel. Yeah. And I said I also enjoy Jenna Friedman's books. I like to read scary things and funny things mostly. It's a good combination. I think so. Would you ever consider writing your own book one day? Be it about your life or just a, a fictional funny. You know, thing. I've been writing a uh, 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 humorous fictional biography, autobiography about wrestling that I'm working on. And one of my resolutions this year was to finish the manuscript because I started it and then got busy with other things. And I want to get back involved with it. So, yes, definitely. I love writing. 
I'm very excited to read that. And can you tell me what else you might be working on this year? You've got some comedy coming up. Comedy coming up. I have a few screenplays I want to get off the ground. And what else? I have a whole list of resolutions. I just wrote up projects I wanted to uh, work more on. Uh, I want to finish the book, get two scripts off the ground. I want to film some more stuff with my brother. And uh, I'm going to be doing some wrestling with my brother. So we'll be, I think we'll be tagging together in a few different cities. Uh, I don't know when this will air, but maybe you've already heard about it by then. So just more of everything. More, more, more. Will that be in the U.S.? I think I read that your brother might be going to Australia at one point. I'll be going to Australia. We have uh, our first U.S. date together will be in Puerto Rico, and that will have been February, uh, January 20th. So that will probably already have happened. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going nuts. A final question. Have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Any messages? Yeah. 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 Come over my house and we'll hang out. Um, I guess my message would be, I think you gotta have a good time and just be nice and stop being a jerk. If you're out there being a jerk in person or online, you gotta stop it. Just be nice and have fun. Um, and if you want to follow anything I do, usually it's Rai Rai Nem Nem. That's on YouTube and Instagram and wherever else. And if you don't want to, I don't care. I have to say, you have one of the funnest internet handles to type. I just enjoy typing Rai Rai Nem Nem when going to your account. It's great. Thank you. Listen. When I when someone in person asks me for it to type in their phone and I say it out loud, they never get it. So I always have to type it because it sounds, when I say Rai Rai Nem Nem, R-Y-R-Y, they just start yeah. typing anything except for that I, maybe my voice is i mumble that could be it well listen this has been a great time thanks for having me on the show i've really enjoyed celebrating your career and thank you for like just all that entertainment i've really have enjoyed going back watching all your old matches and your promos and your the videos are tremendous go to ryan's youtube channel just watch everything i've been lax on promoting and uh, getting the youtube going so i'm gonna try to be better about that thank you for speaking highly of all of this stuff i think it's very nice thanks for having me on this is awesome yeah and you're welcome back anytime when your book's coming out or if you're doing anything else i'm always happy to promote it too awesome thank you very much you're very welcome and thank you to everybody watching at home be sure to share subscribe give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments i'll see you all again soon for another episode of the sarah o'connell show bye thank you so much please subscribe to the sarah o'connell show because if you don't i'm just gonna be so sad thank you very much all right take care speak to you soon bye